What's going on everyone? This is Necrostevo and this is part two of my learning to predict in Pokemon battles tutorial. Thank you all very much for coming to join me today for this. If you haven't already looked at part one, that video dealt primarily with looking at the team preview screen and what you can learn just from looking at the team preview screen to prepare you to predict in battles. Please go check out that video if you haven't seen it, otherwise some parts of this may not make as much sense, I'd imagine. And if you do enjoy the tutorial that I put together for you, please leave a like, and please share with your rivals and your other Pokemon battle friends. Now what are we going to talk about today? Today we're going to talk about three specific parts. First of all, lead Pokemon, and how to figure out which Pokemon your opponent is going to lead with. Second, the early game, most battles last about 20 to 30 turns on average, a little longer if you're dealing with stall teams, uh, but those first 5 to 8 turns, really nailing down your opponent's play style in that time, and also just noticing how your opponent plays in that early game, can really help give you an edge in battle. Now of course this would be different for VTC play, as those battles are a lot shorter, averaging on about 8 turns, and how you, uh, as far as for doubles at least, for VTC play, how you can determine what your opponent is going to be doing for those first two turns primarily. Now as far as lead Pokemon are concerned, there are several factors that really come into play for most lead Pokemon. Naturally, since there is team preview, things like suicide leads and anti-leads are not as effective because you can see your entire opponent's team and they can see your team. They can just change the lead very easily rather than having dedicated leads like we did back in 4th gen. That's not to say you won't still see some of those strategies involving dedicated leads, they just aren't as popular because they're pretty easy to predict when you see them. Factors of a lead Pokemon that most people take into account when they're leading are going to be the speed of a Pokemon, uh, generally fast Pokemon make good leads just because they can move before the opponent can. Um, that also includes Pokemon that have access to priority moves. Not as useful for a lead Pokemon, but it's it's very useful to be able to damage an opponent and then pick them up for the priority move and then they're down a Pokemon on turn 2 of the battle. The second factor that is very common for uh, leads is going to be the Pokemon that can set up entry hazards. Entry hazards are generally going to be much more useful the earlier you set them up. Uh, so if you can predict which opponent, Pokemon your opponent will lead with to set those up, not only can you possibly prevent them from going up, but you may take advantage of them just being single-minded and setting up entry hazards immediately. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times where I figured my opponent might set up some entry hazards, so I took the time to set up in their face and then I was able to at least KO three or four Pokemon before they were able to do much about it because they really should have attacked me instead of setting up entry hazards. Furthermore, Pokemon that have access to U-Turn, Volt Switch, all those switching moves, um, those are pretty good leads generally just because they allow you to get out of a bad situation very easily. If you are utilizing Volt Switch, please take note, like I said in the first video, of ground types your opponent has because it's very likely that they're going to come in and you might just want to do a hard switch instead expecting that. Now any Pokemon that can maintain momentum uh, through the usage of speed or entry hazards and keeping pressure on your uh, side of the field, those are going to be the things that you typically see in lead Pokemon. Other things you might see are Pokemon that are just very tanky. Having a Pokemon that not only is very very tanky and is able to take several hits and may or may not have a way to restore its HP is also a good lead just because it puts less of the burden on yourself for predicting. If you have a Pokemon that you know can take a couple of hits before it goes down, then you can use that time taking those hits to get information about your opponent's Pokemon. Uh, tanky Pokemon that are often seen with Assault Vests are also very common leads just because of their ability to take some serious punishment over time. So a lot of those Pokemon also have access to a lot of coverage moves which make them ideal leads because they either have good matchups against a lot of Pokemon or are very hard to KO in one attack or they have good matchups uh, as far as offensively versus other Pokemon because they just have a lot of coverage moves. So those are the types of things good to keep in mind as far as leads go. If you can predict your opponent's lead, you may want to use that opportunity to set up one of your own Pokemon 
uh, it may be a good opportunity to get up your own entry hazards, to prevent their entry hazards, or uh, use it as an opportunity to help hide some of the information about your team. Uh, a lot of people will give away too much information in the early game, such as possible coverage moves, hidden power type, uh, or just the general move sets by putting a Pokemon out there earlier than they need to be out there. So if you can predict your opponent's lead, you can retain more of that information and therefore make it harder for your opponent to predict your moves. Now in the early game, those first five to eight turns, a lot can happen in an early game. Entry hedges can go up, Pokemon can get set up. You may or may not have the chance to see things like held items. If something takes damage, you get to see if it has leftovers. A lot can go on and a lot can be difficult to process when you have all that information to keep track of at one time. Things that I want you to take particular note of that I like to pay attention to in the early game are going to be the way your opponent plays with their defense. Uh, defensive switch-ins to either whether or not your opponent is switching against something just to take a hit or to be immune to a hit. See how they utilize that Pokemon because chances are the way they utilize it the first time, if it works, then it will be the way that they do that repeatedly throughout the battle. So it's definitely something to keep in mind and then that way, if you can predict that Pokemon coming in, you can take advantage of that and switch up your attack or switch out early and try to double switch and get, catch your opponent off guard. It's also important to know whether or not defensive switch-ins have a way to recover their HP. Uh, Pokemon with access to Wish, Recover, Soft Boiled, or just Rest even sometimes can be very very annoying to take out and you don't want to give your opponent free opportunities to recover their HP. So if you know that Pokemon have a way to recover their HP, not only can you play around that by making sure you say give them a toxic status effect instead of a burn or paralysis, but also, uh, you can predict when they might be recovering their HP and use that as an opportunity to switch out, set up entry hazards, or set up your own um, stat boosting type moves. Please also note that when uh, you play predictably, uh, whether you or your opponent is doing this, people will start to catch on. So if you have your own very good defensive switch in, it's a good idea to notice how many times you're going to that Pokemon because your opponent may try to predict you as well and that's a good time just to, if you have a secondary switch in to throw it at them just to keep them guessing because then they'll have to guess which one you're switching to forcing them to predict a little bit more than you. Now something else that's good to take note of in the early game is going to be the coverage move options that your opponent has access to. Uh, some Pokemon like Gudra, Tyranitar, even Salamence, Garchomp, Aegislash to an extent, they all have access to several different types of builds. And what makes these Pokemon so powerful sometimes is the unpredictability of what set they're running. Now yes, certain sets are more popular than others, but there is no reason to guess what set your opponent is running. When you can play safe, figure out what they have by forcing them to reveal moves to you. This may be something like sending in a uh, Ferrothorn to block a Tyranitar's Rock Slide because you just had a Flying or a Bug type out, and then switching it out again to see if that Tyranitar has access to Flamethrower during the battle. Tyranitar, Gudra, all those guys are commonly seen carrying access to hidden powers and different types of moves, and why take a risk when you can see if you can grab some information to help you predict later. Coverage moves are going to be very, very important because a lot of Pokemon can hit several types super effectively. And with the right coverage move, you can get perfect coverage. And sometimes you have to change up what your defensive switch in is based on what your opponent is using. So just keep those coverage moves in mind and try to get that information. Force your opponent to reveal that information. Never assume when you're in that early game because that's how you lose a Pokemon outright. I, A lot of people say, don't predict too early in the battle. I say predict if you, that's a big risk that you're taking. The number of battles were in 5th gen, I would start off with Lee Galvantula and just energy ball a Swampert because they assume that I wouldn't hit them with that because the, the energy ball is really obvious. But there's no reason to do that. I'm not going to let them know the other moves I have and I don't need to switch out. So why not just energy ball if I don't see any other threats on their team that'll maybe have a Sapsip or something on the energy ball. Now, the other thing you need to keep in mind in the early game 
are entry hazards. I mentioned those a lot in these prediction videos because they are such a big part of the game ever since their inception. Literally doing damage to your opponent just for them switching is a big deal. Now, in the early game, entry hazards are important because you're setting the stage for little bits of damage to be done to your, to your opponent over time. The earlier you get up to your entry hazards, naturally the more effective they will be. However, it's important to note that also for your opponent, this, this also applies, so the later the battle goes on, it's less likely that they will set up entry hazards, and so you can either remove that as a possibility for your opponent to take advantage of, or, at the very least, force them to keep setting them up over and over and over again, thereby wasting their turns and giving you opportunities to have momentum on your side of the field. Also, please note that if you don't have a way or your opponent doesn't have a way to get up entry hazards, it's great to get up the entry hazards and then literally not have to worry about them for the rest of the battle. Uh, so those are pretty useful there. Now as far as VGC goes, um, I think I it's going to be important to note that there are different things to keep in mind there with the early game in VGC. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this is primarily for um, singles, but it's good to figure out based on what your opponent leads off with, the type of combination that they're going to be going for. If they lead off uh, with, for example, Kangaskhan and a Garchomp, you see a very offensive presence there, whereas if they lead off with something that's more defensive, like a Ferrothorn or a Rotom Wash, then you can kind of have an idea of their playstyle through that. What's good to know in VGC is which Pokemon have access to Protect, and which Pokemon have access to priority moves. Both of those are going to be pretty important if only for not either not activating things like Sucker Punch and either switching out to using non-attacking moves on your own side of the field, or predicting that your opponent is going to go for Protect and taking advantage of the free turn that they're giving you. Now sometimes in VGC you're forced into situations where you have to Protect, and Protect is a resource in VGC because every time you use it, you have a lower chance of having your next protect work. So forcing your opponent to use their protects up is definitely a way that you can not only uh, pressure your opponent, but also help reveal some more of that information. If they, if they feel too pressured to protect, they might just attack to hope that it'll work. And you can see if they have those extra coverage moves that we were talking about earlier. Now as far as the opponent's playstyle goes, there are specifically three things that I like to keep in mind, when I, especially when I'm battling a new opponent. The first thing is risk. Does my opponent take risk in the early part of this game? This is important because not only do you gain a little bit of insight to the way that they think, but also when you're predicting later on, and it's like will they attack or will they just make the safe defensive play? Well I've seen them play risky over and over and over again, let's respond in kind. Meanwhile, if your opponent has made relatively safe plays throughout the battle, uh, it's much easier to predict. And this is why sometimes the safe play is a very powerful thing, especially early on. But if you do it too often and you depend on it and you don't ever take any risk, that's a, that a, kind of develops a sense of complacency in the battle. And sometimes you just have to take a risk. And it's up to you to decide what your own win conditions are and when those risks are appropriate. Another thing I like to keep in mind is opportunity windows. Now, I I, uh, I think it's important to mention here, this really goes back to what I was talking about in the first video, as far as what is your opponent's win condition. The window of opportunity is what can I do during this battle to set up a chance for me to get my win condition in play. Often you can't just bring in the Pokemon that you're going to be using and immediately just switch them in for free. You're not going to have that opportunity a lot. You have to use either a Pokemon getting knocked out, or maybe even another Pokemon using U-Turn or Volt Switch, or uh, something like that to bring in another Pokemon safely. That being said, your opponent will be looking at those same aspects of the battle, so minimizing your opponent's window of opportunity is also important. If you expect that your opponent is going to be using U-Turn, maybe you don't want to switch out to force to stop them from bringing in their uh, win condition. Alternatively, you can use other things such as Pokemon with Rough Skin, Rocky Helmet, Iron Barbs. All those can punish your opponent for switching out with U-Turn. Or, just using disrupting moves such as Taunt or 
forcing your opponent out through red card, things like that, they can stop your opponent from being able to utilize their window of opportunity. The thing is though, you have to identify it before you're able to stop them from doing it. So when you're looking at your opponent's team on the team preview, really take note of any Pokemon that might be able to hit several of your Pokemon super effectively, or Pokemon that has the ability to set up and use priority moves. Uh, special examples of course include things like Talonflame, which of course has access to priority flying type moves, uh, Mega Pinsir, Mega Lucario, uh, Mega Kangaskhan, Garchomp, all these Pokemon have the ability to really run through a team if you are actually prepared for it. There's a lot more on that list, and so it can be daunting to prepare for that, but again, experience is sometimes the best teacher. And then finally, priorities. It's important to be keeping in mind what your ever-evolving priorities are and what your opponent's priorities are throughout the match. If you have a Pokemon with a Talon, if you have a Pokemon team with a Talon Flame on it, for example, Stealth Rocks are probably going to be very, very high on your opponent's priority list. Whereas keeping, making sure that those rocks are off the field or making sure that they never go up is going to be high on your own priority list. You don't want one of your Pokemon losing 50% of their HP when they're using moves that cause recoil and you might even be holding a life orb, but that adds up way too quickly, so you definitely have to keep those out of play. On the other side, if your opponent has a defensive core that your win condition cannot break through, your priority is going to be whittling down that defensive core to a point where they can't switch it in and have it not be too hit KO'd by the remaining HP. So you really just have to make sure your priorities are evolving throughout the battle, and keeping track of what your opponent's priorities are throughout the battle is also very useful, just because then you can stay one step ahead of them. So, I hope that this video has been useful. Be sure to stay tuned for part 3, where we're going to be talking about the late um, and mid game of a Pokemon battle, and also just kind of the aftermath, talking about things you can learn from a battle, especially if you lose. I find that often you learn a little bit more from a battle that you lose versus ones that you win. But you know, it's always good to take stock at the end. Make sure you leave a like if you enjoyed this video, and I will talk to you all soon. Bye bye now.